Hey, what happened to that pair of thongs that you used to wear? Well, I gave those to the police. No, not, not those, the other pair. Oh, well, I threw them away. When? A while ago, I don't know. <laughs> Why are you being so curious all of a sudden? Maybe if I'd been a little more curious before, we wouldn't be in this situation. What's that supposed to mean? It's supposed to mean what it means, Candy. Welcome back to the official Love and Death podcast. I'm Nancy Miller. This fifth episode of the show is titled The Arrest. So it's no spoiler to know that someone is arrested for the murder of Betty Gore. The shocker for everyone in Wiley, Texas, is that the person arrested is Candy Montgomery. Who is this woman that everybody thought they knew? To shed more light on that question, we'll hear from two people in this production who know Candy Montgomery best. Patrick Fugit, who plays on-screen husband Pat Montgomery, and Audrey Fisher, the series costume designer who reveals Candy's sartorial transformation from perfect homemaker to murder suspect. And in our Only in Texas segment of the show, we'll hear from Texas Monthly senior editor Emily McCuller on why 1980 was the year the world became obsessed with Texas. But first, we'll talk with Love & Death costume designer Audrey Fisher about how her clothes brought characters to life and why the most valuable accessory in the entire series is a pair of cheap flip-flops. Audrey Fisher, welcome to the Love & Death podcast. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Okay, you are no stranger to the 70s. One of your earliest gigs was on that 70s show, it's kind of supposed to be kitsch. Yeah. Now you are in a true crime drama. You have yeah. to make things look real and yes. appealing and not distracting. Well, okay. So costumes, you know, costumes are there to support the character and mm-hmm. sort of make an actor give this give this second skin so an actor can really step into the character and sort of understand historically, you know, contextually, like who this person is. So whenever I'm, you know, designing costumes for a show, my first place to start is research. It becomes the map. Once we know who the cast is, so I had my amazing cast, you know, to sort of think about. And I then I go to the research of the real characters. In this case, I had real people to focus on. Um, there wasn't a lot of research to be found for these char- these actual folks. Uh-huh. Um, the place where I did find some research was in stills from um, news footage and a couple of, like, newspaper articles, um, things that, you know, had sort of referenced the trial. So I took a lot of screenshots from that. Yes. Um, and then I basically just, like, leaned into the late 70s in sort of like, you know, a, a bedroom community of Dallas. Um, also a Methodist community. You Which know, means? A, so in these small towns mm-hmm. um, in the Silicon Prairie, um, essentially you're not, it's like you're not living in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And these communities were all sort of structured around their churches and sort of, you know, Sunday after church, having your picnic and going to church and having all the different sort of events where you're teaching the kids, like after school programs and all that. It was all very choir. Mm-hmm. It was all very centered around this sort of like, not secular, but more sort of Methodist communities. Um, and in that context, the clothes are, you know, not as like jazzy and snazzy and over the top as sort of like city folk. Right. Right. So... That was one thing I had to sort of delineate was that I'm working with I'm working with people who are, you know, living sort of in a smaller town. Right. Um, of course, they're probably going to shop in Dallas like Candy right. mm-hmm. likes to be au courant. So she was probably going to Dallas every now and then and buying sort of the most, you know, a couple of nice pieces that she would wear. Mm-hmm. But overall, these are people who are wearing kind of more normal clothes. So you put together, you're thinking about each one of these characters because you're right. The point of a a, a costume designer is to help the audiences understand the character better. Mm -hmm. And you may not see all of those little details, but you're going to feel them as you're watching the show. Yes. So what were the what were the conversations having and what did you learn about them in these conversations? You're absolutely right. The details read and the actor feels all the details. And that's like my main goal is to be in a fitting with an actor and sort of help them build up this sense of a character more than anything, right? The fitting room is sort of like that magic place where this right. alchemy happens mm. and you see the character sort of come to life, which right. is it's astonishing, especially, I have to say, with Patrick Fugit. It was like, 
did not even I know. recognize him. I know. Like looking at the contemporary Patrick Fugit and the Pat. Amazing. In the sweet shorts, by the way, but in the Pat, like sure. it's a total. It, it's like a different. I know. But it's the glasses yeah. and it's the dad and, and ensembles. Yes. And, and okay. Yes. I interrupted you though. No, no, sorry. I, I was just like dreaming of Patrick. Um, <laughs> the, we had the glasses in the fitting, and the minute like we put him in the outfit, and then it was just the glasses on, and it was suddenly like Pat in the room. And that happens sometimes. You have these kind of magical moments with actors where. You know, so Patrick is the kind of actor who really goes there completely in a fitting. Mm-hmm. That's not always what you get, but he did. Right. And it was, like, delightful. Glasses on, and suddenly his posture changed, and he sort of, like, shrugged over to the side, and he was suddenly Pat. It was wild. The sense was that Pat really doesn't care about fashion or really get it, you know? Like, he's just he's just a guy. He's putting on a suit. He's going to work. He's working really hard. He's coming home. And we tried to sort of make it feel like Candy was trying to, like, there were some pieces in his wardrobe that clearly Candy picked out for him, be like, hey, honey, put this on. Let's right. try this. Like, there's a couple of velour shirts <laughs> that we felt like, oh, Candy got that. Like, she went downtown and she got that, you know, on whatever. And that she felt like, we have to kind of zazz it up a little bit. Even with Patrick, um, he was like, yeah, I think that Pat really doesn't care, but Candy does. Right. And so she sort of encourages him to try to be a little more aware of his sartorial choices, but he really isn't aware. So she keeps trying to, like, kind of bring him along. And that scene in the last episode where she's going to the police station for the first time Mm -hmm. and Candy's all dressed up more than we've ever seen her. That was kind of the last moment that it was her. Like, she got dressed up to go kind of deflect yes. and sort of, you know, and she put on that beautiful, we made that beautiful silk blouse. We made that skirt. Like we gave her this really, like it was kind of one of her most um, kind of elegant outfits. Absolutely. And um, and it was striking. And, you know. And almost we, like femme fatale. Yes. And as we know from the book, he was like, whoa, you know, like, wow. Yeah. And I think it also made him think like, hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. What? It, why is she dressing up like that? Because she comes home and she changes, right, from a normal sort of running around town look and, and suddenly comes out in this, like, kind of almost like a date night look. Um, and, and as a, and as a, as a costume designer, yeah. that is – what does that say? That yeah. she's looking at this as she needs to be it's extra? It's a performance. Right. Yeah, it's a performance. So your, your theory is this is the last day that we see the real candy yes. before yes. shit goes sideways. I'm pretty sure that's, like, it's the last sort of day that she presents herself – it, and she's in control of her image. I want to get to the, I guess what you would call the smoking flip-flops. Because, mm-hmm. all right, we have two really important pieces yes. of what will be potential evidence. We have the axe, obviously, mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. what we will, you know, the murder weapon, mm-hmm. allegedly. Mm-hmm. And then we have a seemingly totally innocuous pair of what, you know, 10 cent flip-flops. Yes. And now I had this feeling like, okay, this is a really important item. Yes. And this is a really important item for you to get right. And it could have been one of those things where you guys went to, you know, a drugstore down the street yeah. or that it took like $10,000 in two years to put together. Right. right. <laughs> Tell me right. about the flip-flops because well, they're so important. Yes. So the real Robert Udishin came and consulted with us and I reached out to him early on to talk about details to make sure I was getting anything right. And so he was the one who would describe the murder outfit. You know, he was the one who ah. like like was the first one to discuss the murder, you know, like Robert Udishin. So he was the one when I, I had an illustration done of both of the murder looks because right. those I had to, you know, they were built and um, I wanted to be very specific, and I needed to get approval from Debbie Kelly and Leslie Gladder and everyone before I started to create these looks. I had to make sure that both women were on board, but also, much like the court outfits, I had to stick with reality pretty much, right, because they're very well described. And, you know, I just wanted to honor those very tragic outfits mm-hmm. as much as I could. So... um I did speak to Robert. I said so because the description is like rubber, um, rubber shoes or rubber rubber sandals. And I was like, "Is that a flip flop? Are we talking about a flip flop?" He's like, "Yeah." I was like, "I sent a picture of a flip flop." I'm like, "A flip flop?" And he was like, "Yes." I was like, "Okay." Then the search began <laughs> for the flip flop. Um, so yes. What happens first is you try to find the 70s flip-flop. You try to find the early 80s flip-flop. You I think know, we used you, to call them thongs. Yes, exactly. thongs, right. Um, and so we scoured everywhere to find them. But guess what? They're like, they're all turning to dust. So, yeah, we started to find them. 
it was clear that we also we needed like a dozen. I think we had 15. We needed 15 pair for the stunt, for the stunt person, as a prop, as a this, you know, multiple pairs for she's Lizzie. Got, she's got to cut them up. Yeah, you've got to cut them up. I mean, they were a prop and an outfit piece. So we needed, you know, some for props, some for us, whatever. So we knew we also needed like 15. So we start looking like everywhere, you know, Blair's, like all these online, whatever. We start getting them all in for the first fitting with Lizzie with the murder look. We started trying things on, and none of them fit right. So basically, after like getting every flip-flop in America into our fitting room, it was exhausting. I really wanted to stick with a light-colored flip-flop so we could see the blood, because the whole point is that, you know, you see it. So finally found a white, all-white flip-flop at, do you want to guess where? Uh, no, I have no idea. Target. Oh. <laughs> Target <laughs> saved us. So shifting gears a little bit. You mentioned earlier something about honoring Betty in her wardrobe. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit more about that so I can just hear it from someone that, again, you're thinking about, I'm thinking about the actors, the writers, how they're creating it for us to enjoy. Yeah. But I, you're someone that's been thinking about it on a totally different level. Yeah. So where you end up with Betty is where? How did you make sure that you honored? It? What does that mean? Yeah. Well, I have to say that I think that, you know, my conversation with Lily – when she, you know, <laughs> when she, when, when we knew that she was our Betty, and I sent her the documents that I had and all the, all the research, you know, I think I had, we had a very in-depth conversation about how to portray Betty and honor Betty because her sense was, you know, like we do talk about the postpartum and not feeling good in her body. And there's a way that you can kind of slide into kind of a dumpy Betty mm -hmm. discussion. And and she was very clear, like, that's not that's not who I think this person is. You know, I think this person is 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 trying and she's trying to hang in there and she's depressed, but she wants to she loves her husband and she wants this marriage and she's trying so hard and you know, and, and it was wonderful to have her sort of remind me that it wasn't gonna be as simple as like the pretty girl nice. and the plump girl. She actually was like a lively character and someone that you can identify with and someone who kind of makes sense as the sort of foil to Candy. Well, yeah, and she kind of calls Candy out on her bullshit. She I does. definitely relate it to Betty in a lot of ways, yes. you know, where yes. you're looking at sort of difficult women, yes. women who sort of blurt out the thing that's the true thing and they're not supposed to. Yeah. And yeah. then on top of that, yeah. one of the reasons why, you know, everyone has their reasons for thinking about Candy in this incident, but yeah. was it had nothing to do with Alan at all, but someone right. who saw right. Candy in a her. way that she yeah. didn't want her to be seen. Exactly. And, and yeah, when she sees that moment, you know, when she's looking out the window and she sees that intimacy and she's like seeing she's catching moments of intimacy between between Candy and Alan. Like she sees it kind of far off. Um, also, what really helped me was there was I found a lot of images of of Betty in her life and just like sweet pictures of her, like holding her dog and smiling, holding her baby, you know, just trying to like relate to the fact that this is a real person who went through this hideous death and just wanting to capture her essence in a way and sort of get to that little sweetness yeah of this like sweet mom <laughs> well you have the most fun job and it's also i so appreciate the amount of thought and detail that you and your team put into this and the connections that you have with the people that we see on screen and then those yeah. who are orchestrating this world yeah. that we're there to enjoy yeah. and also to learn from yeah so thank you so much, Audrey Fisher, oh, for joining me on this thank podcast. You. Thanks again to Audrey Fisher for being on the show. And for putting Patrick Fugit, who is no stranger himself to 70s fashion from his early role in the movie Almost Famous. Thanks for putting him in a pair of short shorts. Because, as we're about to learn from Patrick himself, those shorts, along with a pair of wholly transformational glasses, were his superpower in playing Candy's quietly loyal but deeply conflicted husband, Pat Montgomery. And Pat's going to need all the help he can get as he stands by his woman, Candy, who's about to stand trial for murder. I'll get it. Hello? Pat, it's Don Crowder. Don't say anything, just listen for a bit, okay? Candy says you want to know the truth about everything, and I'm thinking that's a good idea. 
So I'm going to tell you what happened. Is that okay, Pat? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. I'm going to tell you exactly. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast, Patrick. Um, at the end of this episode, your character, Pat Montgomery, is on the phone. And he's listening to Don Crowder telling him this staggering piece of news about his wife, Candy, and that she did, in fact, kill Betty Gore. So let's back up a little bit and talk about Pat Montgomery, because um, I I think that the biggest challenge, I imagine, for uh, an actor is finding the, the truth in a performance, and especially in true crime. So when we're looking at Pat Montgomery, what was it that was appealing to you in this husband uh, figure, this guy who has to ride shotgun to a very strange, high-profile, and ultimately violent conclusion? Well, myself and the character that David created um, or wrote onto the page are fairly different. I I don't feel uh, the way Pat feels. I don't really view the world through the same lens as him and so that type of a you know difference is is interesting for me usually Mm -hmm. um i i tend to be drawn more towards that than i do to characters that i really feel close to in terms of like who i am as a person you start to conflate who you are and who the character is meant to be for the story and i see that happen fairly often. If I identify with my character and it's important to me in that way, then eventually the character is going to do something I find distasteful or I don't agree with. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. that becomes a matter of personal principle rather than the importance for the story. And um, really, you know, that's what we are there to do is tell a story. So playing a character that you really don't feel close to in my opinion is is actually pretty freeing and uh, mm. and appealing and uh, and it was it wasn't necessarily Pat Montgomery the character it was talking to Leslie and David about the story why they wanted me involved what they thought I could bring to it they were like we need a sort of milk toast every guy looking <laughs> type of dude we've seen you on the Google and we think you fit that description um, no, they, uh, they, they were very kind. They said that they were assembling a cast that they felt was, uh, had a primarily authentic tone. So mm. when, when you look at the, the rest of the cast, which is a, a, an amazing thing for them to say, it makes my ego more of a problem than it already is. Um, <laughs> But it it also lets me know like we're not getting into anything broad. This is not um, <clears throat> this is not like a reenactment type of territory. Like they're looking to tell a very human story with very authentic people, and it and it needs to feel immersive and real because we're exploring how people make decisions, how these people particularly make decisions um, through this whole process. And you kind of, like you say, you kind of have to believe that. You have to be in on, like, the idea that this is really happening in front of you. Let's talk about how the 70s and the the costumes and the way that you, you know, are coming to this. How much does that inform you as an actor to, like, bring the depth of performance? Yeah, I mean, the way my clothing sits on me uh, in, in my normal life. Uh, completely informs the postures I take throughout the day, what my body is capable of doing. And so putting on the Pat Montgomery clothing that that we all chose, or really, you know, that the brilliant wardrobe department had prepped, started to immediately change my posture. They also had reference photos of Pat Montgomery that I hadn't seen. I couldn't find a lot of video or photos of Pat Montgomery online. So I had some idea, but they had a whole bunch of photos where it it was showing how he would sit in a chair. It showed how he would stand. It showed how he carried his sort of facial structure, the glasses, of course, that he 
uh, war, which were like this amazing, uh, had this amazing effect on the character, Pat Montgomery. Well, in this episode, we see Pat have to make decisions that he's in this fork, potentially, with his life and his relationship with his wife. And uh, he has to make some decisions. What's he saying about the case, the strategy? He doesn't want me to talk about it. What do you mean? I mean, he doesn't want me to talk about it. Not even with me. No, not with anyone. And honestly, Pat, I don't want to. I'm so tired. I'm just going to turn this whole matter over to God and Dawn and just not talk about it with anybody else. Candy, I am your husband. You need to talk to me. Do you know what I need? I need to follow my lawyer's advice. He's in charge, Don Crowder and God. In case you haven't noticed, I'm not doing too good. That means uh, having to go to bat for her in ways that he may not have expected. Mm -hmm. And that's a really interesting moment where we see, is Pat Montgomery in this with Candy uh, or is he not? He doesn't have all the information yet. But did you and Elizabeth Olsen, your co-star, sort of like how do you approach a dynamic when you have to play a couple that's been married for a long time uh, and having to have these very quiet internal conflicts that we see play out. Do you guys have conversations about that? Or is this just something that is written in the scene and there you are and you're, you're playing it in the moment? That's a great question. I think that there was some uh, preparation with, with Elizabeth and with Leslie um, where we, we talked about how these two were going to come across during our scenes. Um, you know, what is it about them that is not fulfilling to Candy? And uh, what is it about them that we want to work out? Um, you know, Pat, like you say, he, he is not only standing by her through the affair and his discovery of it, but he's going to stand by her and then take the stand um, to sort of further reveal who Candy Montgomery is, you know, what was possible in terms of uh, Candy's actions and intents, you know, Pat is a pure lens for the jury or, or for the audience to understand, like, maybe more of, or, of the true Candy. You yes, know? yeah. But Pat is sort of the, the true filter of who she is. You know, he has, a, he has the perspective on what she's capable of. And, um, and then in terms of how we come across, you know, <clears throat> Lizzie and I get along very well and have a good sort of fun, uh, joking type of rapport. And, um, we kind of use that in the beginning. It's a good chemistry to have, to show that these, yeah. these two got married young. They've always got along. They've always, if you were looking in from the outside, it's like, well, Pat, Pat has his kind of milk toast thing. Candy's very charismatic, but the two of them get along very well. You know, like he's got some silly pun type of humor and she thinks mm -hmm. it's just silly and only a little annoying, you know, like that kind of stuff. And, um, but when they have serious conversations, you can see Pat tries to make it a joke again. He tries to get back to the, the kind of core of their relationship, which is a superficial type of r rapport rather than a real intimacy. And in this episode is this is incredible revelatory moment where he says something to the effect of, you know, if I had been paying attention earlier, I maybe wouldn't have to be paying so much of close attention now. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of resentment coming through, a little bit of blame, um, you know, the, the sort of darker side of the pressure that they're experiencing. Um, but he's also he's also a little bit uh, self-critical in that moment. That, that's the kind of unique thing about Pat Montgomery is that he's very self-critical and ultimately accountable. That, that's his first sort of beat yeah. is to get her flowers and write her a letter that's all about his side of the street, you know, like how he's contributed to the lack of intimacy or the lack of partnership going on. So that's a that's a unique thing. And that that's pretty uncommon in terms of human beings, you know. He has all of the power in this relationship to divorce her if he wanted to. And instead, 
he pulls flowers from under the bed. Yeah, I think um, Pat does his initial flowers and letter, and they have a sort of catharsis, the two of them, as a partnership, and they they decide to be partners. And so when Pat starts to understand that Candy is not sharing information with him um, one way or the other, like, hey, what happened to the flip-flops? Um, either way, like if it's an innocent thing that's happened or if it's a very incriminating thing that's happened, you know, I have decided already to be on your team. And so, you know, information is power and powerful. And so if you are hoarding or keeping information, you know, you're keeping power. And so Pat maybe doesn't have that quantified, but for sure, Pat is tracking that he is losing his status as a partner and a team member. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, Candy does have a, a hard time with the truth, you know, she talks about the royal hue this unquantified sort of mm. thing that maybe will fulfill her if she can just get it, if she can just reach out far enough and pick it out of the void, it will heal her. It will make her happy. Like she will find what she needs out there in the royal hue, but it's not quantified. Something that I find really interesting, and I think like that needs to be serve better to understand Pat Montgomery as a character is that the vividness of his life is off screen. He's a brilliant engineer, right? He's works at Texas Instruments. He works on top secret stuff, you know, but how do you sort of imbue a lot of the intelligence and ambition and even like lost dreams of being a musician that Pat had years ago? Like, how do you sort of put that into someone when you're not going to stand there and announce Pat's dreams and resumes, especially someone who's a he's a he's a logic and science guy. He's you know he's a quant. He's not like Pat yeah. uh, Candy, who's a word person. Candy is like a fucking. She's like those um, glass spheres at the planetarium that have the electric <laughs> ball in the middle, and it's like the, yeah, the, it's the, like the, Tesla. the lightning bolts. Yeah, yeah, the lightning bolts are always going out to the edge of the sphere, like. Yeah. I always yeah. picture Candy as that. Like when she shows up at church, everybody's fucking electrified by her presence. Like mm. uh, Jackie Ponder, electrified by Candy. Um, you know, everybody. And I and I think, um, I think Pat enjoys that. And I do think Pat has, like I, I don't really, I never saw Pat as being very fulfilled by what he does. I think he just sort of thought like, oh, I'm I'm good enough at this that I can do it, and mm -hmm. I can make sure we have all the boxes ticked, the good house, cars, you know, food, like people, people are eating and they sleep in an air conditioned house. Like we're, we're doing pretty good. And, um, <laughs> and in terms of the other things that he doesn't find very fulfilling, I don't think he's very deliberate. I think that part of the problem or the disconnect between him and Candy is that Pat is not very deliberate about that. I don't think Pat's very happy in the relationship. I think that he is yeah. sort of coasting. He's just not one of those self-igniters. He's not somebody like Candy who's like going to do the work and start to push things out into the universe to change the circumstances around her. Pat is more a recipient of circumstances. He will just kind of hang around and whatever happens in the world, he's sort of subject to, you know, and he's kind of okay with that. He doesn't really know that there's another way to be and and still be happy and successful. Well, we're we're at a pivot point, I think, in episode five, where whether he likes it or not, Skin is in the game with his marriage with Candy. He has to put up and find a way to secure thousands of dollars to make <laughs> sure that she doesn't spend a night in jail. Yeah, he's a decent person who wants to make sure that his wife has dignity. And so, as we look at the coming episodes. Can you just kind of, without revealing too much, can you give us a little bit of an arc for Pat? So when we're watching the, you know, the next couple of episodes, as this comes to a, as this hurdles towards a conclusion, what are we going to be looking for with Pat in the next episodes? Well, Pat is going to really have to define how much he cares. I think it's pr it's obvious that Pat cares very, very much. He's just not sure how to <laughs> how to notice it or what to care about. 
And that's really like what we start to see from him is, is, is he is put in a position where totally unexpectedly he's jumped into the deep end of this crazy scenario where he's going to have to really come to bat for her, really extend to, to do what he thinks he needs to do to help her. And, uh, and what Don tells him is needed, you know, eventually Pat is going to have to do something in the trial to Don. It's obvious that Pat is the lens that everybody needs to see candy through to, uh, to know like, Hey, you know, we, we now understand what her intent may have been, or we can at least say that she did not have the intent to go to this, to go to Betty's house and do this thing. Um, and it's through Pat's impression of her that, uh, that everybody kind of realizes that, I think. I think it's a big moment. And from what I understand, uh, it was a big moment in the actual trial. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And to do all of that uh, with the public impression that he's a cuckold and yes. that he's been wronged and that he should just leave, you know, he should just let her hang. Um, all of that is, uh, by the way, the same type of framework that led them to their sort of <laughs> unfulfilled position in the first place. Well, thank you so much, Patrick, for joining us on this podcast. And um, I, gosh, I can't wait to see what happens in the coming episodes. And your thank you for bringing a, a complicated and quiet character uh, to life with riches and thoughtfulness and detail. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for awesome questions. Good convo. Thanks again to Patrick Fugit for joining us on the podcast. Now, on to our only in Texas part of the pod. For most of 1980, the world was obsessed with another shocking Texas crime. Only this one? It was the murder attempt of a fictional TV character named J.R. Ewing on the iconic TV series Dallas. And the question, who shot J.R., was a global phenomenon. While entertaining, the series Dallas perpetuated a certain image of the stereotypical Texan that is still with us today. An image that magazines like Texas Monthly and now series like Love and Death are pushing back against. For more on the Texas image versus the far more interesting reality, here's Texas Monthly senior editor Emily McCuller, who published a feature in the March 2023 issue of Texas Monthly, why 1980 was the year Texas went worldwide. Emily McCuller, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Nancy. Very excited to be here. Who Shot JR was a huge pop culture phenomenon. So how did Dallas kick off a global fascination with all things Texas in the 80s? I mean, it was the world's way in to Texas culture. It was such an American story, too, especially for the 80s, because, you know, it's greed and wealth and flashiness and all this stuff that I think other cultures really ate it up. There was already, by the premiere of Urban Cowboy in 1980 and by, you know, the time that somebody shot Jr. There was already like a lot of cultural fascination with Texas and that kind of stemmed from the fashion community and like Texas socialites being at Studio 54, being thought of as very glamorous. And the reason that they were was because they there was just so much money in Texas in the 70s because of oil. It was a thriving place. It was just we had extremely rich, flashy people with Texas accents, which everybody loves an accent. How would you describe the real 1980 that Candy Montgomery and Betty Gore were living in versus the one we saw on TV with Dallas? I think that there has always been a relationship between Texas as the world sees us and Texas as it is. Both Dallas and Love and Death have plot lines that seem unbelievable. We see in this very episode of Love and Death, Candy goes under hypnosis so she can recall the murder of Betty Gore, which sounds like something straight out of a soap opera like Dallas. Except here, it's true. And what I was thinking about with Love and Death is that we still have this cultural fascination in um, these salacious topics, murder, sex, affairs, family betrayal, all of these things you can still see on TV. And that was the DNA of something like Dallas. But Dallas was a soap opera. I mean, just almost shameless in its 
silliness, I suppose, or camp perhaps is maybe a better word. And what television can do now, what Love and Death does now, is uses these stories to like really get into understandings of character, to like find these really artful, intelligent, relatable, universal themes that we can really see. They really get in deeper than something like Dallas ever did. Dallas was all about plot and drama. And even though the plots of Love and Death, you know, with the with the very violent murder, mm-hmm. even though those plots are just as salacious as perhaps anything on Dallas would have been, it's not just about that. It's, it's about character and people and art and all these things that I think is so exciting. What was interesting to me is how a show like Dallas and the Who Shot JR phenomenon set up like an expectation that just about anything can happen in Texas. Yeah. Two women from the same church in the same community can get into a conflict that ends in one of them being murdered. Yeah. And 40 years later, we're still compelled to understand why. Yeah, absolutely. So in order for love and death to exist, we need Dallas to exist. Yes. We need a multiverse of Texasness mm-hmm. that goes into infinity. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Emily, so much for joining us on this podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Nancy. Oh, and by the way, spoiler alert, Kristen Shepard, Sue Ellen's younger sister, who was also JR's mistress, is the one who shot JR. Hers was a crime of passion. But for Candy, her reasons for killing Betty Gore remain unclear. So as the case heads to trial, it's now on her lawyer, Don Crowder, to figure out a way to win this case. Just how far will he go? We'll hear all about it from actor Tom Pelfrey, who plays Candy's brash lawyer. We'll also put the spotlight on his not-so-secret weapon, a young criminal attorney named Robert Udishin. Thanks for listening to the Love and Death podcast. We'll be back next Thursday. The official Love and Death podcast is an HBO Max production in partnership with Texas Monthly Studio the in-house agency for Texas Monthly. Our executive producers are Maddie Builder and Aaron Kubatsky. The podcast is written, produced, and hosted by me, Nancy Miller. Brian Standifer is our audio engineer, editor, and mixer. Music is courtesy of Warner Media, HBO Max, and Brian Standifer. Watch Love and Death now on HBO Max.